first quantum minerals just announced that its board has approved plans for a 1.25 billion dollar expansion of the company's transanti copper mine in zambia first floated in january 2020. this is a decision that the miner said was prompted by renewed confidence in zambia's investment climate since president hakende hachilema's election last august zambia has implemented business-friendly reforms including allowing mining companies to deduct mineral royalties from their income tax assessments. The economy was a large part of the election that brought Hachilema into power, and the focus has been on the president to see how he could steer the country out of the situation Zambia finds itself. So just what is that situation? In November of 2020, Zambia opted to bow out of a $42.5 million euro bond repayment becoming the first African nation to default on its debt in the COVID-19 era. The country's debt profile had been spiraling in recent years, owing to issues that predated the pandemic and leaving creditors wrangling over who should take losses on loans. But the situation in Zambia shouldn't be so. The country is Africa's second largest copper producer. However, as copper prices plummeted, servicing repayments on its estimated $11 billion debt pile became increasingly difficult. But there finally seems to be some light at the end of the tunnel. Zambia's debt restructuring talks are expected to kick off soon, and this is largely because China has now agreed to be part of the dialogue. According to the most recent Zambian government data, China and Chinese entities held, seven, held rather $5.78 $5 billion of Zambia's debt at the end of 2021. The country's finance minister said that an international monetary fund program should be concluded by the end of June, and the World Bank has also committed to providing financial resources to the country once the IMF deal is agreed. Today, we look at Zambia's debt talk. This is Business Edge. I'm Tolulope Adilaru Balogun. And joining me from Lusaka, Zambia, is Sibamba Kayama. He is an economist and former communications officer at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, Chibamba, welcome once again to Business Edge. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Tolo. Thank you so much. And uh, happy to, to get that uh, background you gave. Excellent picture. Good All data. Right. Thank you so much. So we know that in 2020, Zambia became the first country uh, to default in the pandemic era on its loans. And in 2021, it applied for the G20 debt relief, but hasn't received any debt, any debt cancellation or any debt forgiveness. So in the space of the time from the default to now, what has been happening? Um, much has been happening um, in the background. We haven't uh, received any debt cancellation so far. Um, we also have continued to default um, on the coupons. However, what has happened is that Zambia has reached a, what we call a staff level agreement uh, for a possible IMF program, which should now be concluded. I'm sure by next month it should be concluded. That's the first achievement. And two, we have had renewed confidence in, in Zambia uh, with respect to uh, investment. Uh, you gave that background, particularly to the mining sector. We're also experiencing some significant uh, monetary uh, stability, monetary in the sense that inflation has been coming down drastically. Uh, the exchange rate has more or less been quite stable. Um, it has dropped from about 23 uh, quite a pay dollar to an average 17 quite a pay dollar. That is a very big achievement. And all this goes to the current discussions going on. But the major one, as we indicated, is that uh, the debt negotiations are ongoing in terms of restructuring the major hurdle, which has been IMF, I mean, China, one of the biggest uh, uh, single creditors to Zambia, has agreed to uh, join the credit committee. So to us, this is a very big achievement that opens the door for further uh, discussions and an IMF program itself. Yeah, that's really good to hear because, as I said earlier, um, part of the elections was mainly predicated on the issues around the economy. And hearing that miners are coming back into Zambia and that there's been renewed interest 
shows that there's a lot of potential there. Let me follow up with that. So we've heard that the president has been able to introduce more business-friendly uh, policies or things into. So beyond the mines and beyond bringing able to bring inflation down and the restructuring talks happening, what's happening in terms of the business environment? Um, it's not much to say in terms of overall business environment. Uh, I think everybody's on their way to see more. Um, this, this is to ensure that there's significant stability. The other uh, elephant in the room has to do with the mining sector itself. So let us look at two things. The first one, Zambia has more or less repossessed two mining companies, one of them KCM, that in terms of uh, the law is under liquidation. So, so this has underperformed in a, to a very big degree. And two Mopani, Glencoe, the old owners of Mopani copper mines, um, also decided to um, move out of Zambia and surrender the mine to uh, Zambian government. So these are two uh, big problems that have to be sorted out. The good news though is that um, uh, I understand Zambia has now found an advisor on the way forward. Advisor uh, who may be the Rothschild, I, I, I'm, I'm sure it should be the Rothschild, who have come on board to pr pr provide a way forward on the mining sector, particularly with the two, two companies, because we cannot afford to own them as a country. We have to have private investment into them. So that is one big achievement on, on that score. Um, the mineral royalty deductibility, this has been a significant one. And as you heard from First Quantum Minerals, who are unlocking about uh, 1.2 uh, billion US dollars to ex ex extend investment in Kansanshi mine, this is a, a significant one. And the response is a direct response to government's um, policy, fiscal policy measures that make sure that mineral oil taxes are now uh, deductible for tax. So these have been quite significant. But we have also seen that um, portfolio investment, these um, short-term money investors in our treasury bills and other money markets have been flooding Zambia lately. That's why we're experiencing some level of oversubscription. Mm -hmm. So this calls to heighten investor confidence in Zambia. The policy regime is beginning to be very stable and uh, inflation coming down to 11% from about 24% just within one year is a significant achievement. And, and everybody looks forward to that. You, if you stabilize the fiscal regime to that extent, the next thing is uh, the both um, private investors, these are foreign direct investors and portfolio investors begin to come into your country. And we're already seeing that happening now. So this seems like more than light at the end of the tunnel. There's obviously tracks being laid to really bring Zambia out of this. But I want to quickly ask you about the figures that we hear, because for Zambia's economy and for the people of Zambia, they are staggering. Almost $32 billion in debt, which is almost around 120% of the country's GDP. So do you think this is accurate or is it plus or minus? Because we also know when President Hachilima came into power, he talked about meeting empty coffers and meeting a cloudy situation, not being sure exactly who Zambia owed and how much the, uh, the, company, uh, the country, I beg your pardon, also owed. So are we around the right mark at about $32 billion of debt? Absolutely. We, we have had um, the Lazard fair, Lazard consultants who have been in the country were hired by the previous regime. And what they have done now is to compute, verify and audit the debt levels. So the figures that you're hearing, hearing now are correct. So we're talking in the range of about 25 billion US dollars. This, this, this figure includes domestic debt. Domestic debt, foreign debt of about 11, 11 billion US dollars, and also government guarantees to power status. This brings that total figure. This is the audited uh, figure by last. Um, and it's for the first time where, where the country now knows who we are. So the, the, the list is actually articulated. And it, it includes Zambian citizens as well, who we all want Zambian investors, Zambian local businessmen, about 300 million US dollars. So th this is a figure that has been computed. Now, you said something there that when the president came in, he said he inherited more or less like uh, empty coffers. Well, in, in terms of fiscal management, uh, a, a, a country that is on a budget, 
where revenues are guaranteed, you can plan for that deficit. So you may not necessarily say we inherited uh, uh, empty coffers because you, you, you money comes in and you spend. Money comes in as revenue through taxes and you spend it. So it's not empty. However, what the president was implying here is whenever the money comes in, and this is your point, whatever we collect in terms of taxes, the expenditure is already predetermined. You are talking about 45% of that amount of money you earn every period due for debt service. In other words, even if you have got this predetermined income through revenues, much of it is going to debt service. Almost 50% of that amount of money is going for debt service, leaving you very small percentage because you have emoluments as well to pay salaries to civil service, which gobbles another 50%. So you basically remaining with about 10% of your total revenues in the budget going for social expenditure, in education, in health, in security. And, and that is a very small amount of money. And that's what he meant by saying we inherited empty coffers in the sense that the money is already committed to servicing foreign debt. All right, so let's talk about some of those people that Zambia owes. Now, China has finally agreed to be part of the debt restructuring conversation, and we hear from the uh, Zambian Minister of Finance that they had to go and complain that there were delays, and they needed to sort of put the partners under pressure. China owes around $5.8 billion of Zambia's debt, about a third of Zambia's total debt. So is the involvement of China in these debt conversations based on the fact that they own the largest amount of Zambia's debt, or is there another conversation to be had? Again, given, of course, the Belt and Road Initiative that China has and the incursion that China has been making into the African continent. Now, the, the, this, has, the, this had to happen uh, because of the IMF program. Remember I mentioned the IMF program that is coming on board and the staff, staff level agreement was reached last December. And the IMF board is due to sit in June the next month to possibly approve that yeah. date. And it comes with it about 1.4 uh, billion US dollars. That is the money that will be pumped over a phased period to Zambia. And um, the IMF gave a precondition that, look, we are going to give you this concessionally wrong, concessionally in the sense that this is low interest law of nearly nothing in terms of interest law. And it will help cushion some of the challenges that Zambia will be facing during this period. However, Zambia still has challenge of a choking debt level. There's what is called debt sustainability. The debt is not sustainable. If you have to continue to, to, to service this debt, there will be nothing left for the country to spend on all other needs like social security and health and so forth. So the IMF gave a condition that will give you this money, uh, which will unlock further opportunities for you to get bilateral support. But for that to happen, for that to happen, you have to reschedule the existing debt, debt which I say choking debt levels. And we can give you this money to be repaid over a three-year period. Okay, this is how IMF programs work anyway. Three-year period, you service it. But those other non-concessional creditors to Zambia, who include the Eurobond and the Chinese, have to be paid over a period of time. So we begin to negotiate the restructuring of this state. And the IMF committed to take a lead in, in, into these negotiations and discussions. China was the biggest challenge here because all other creditors were saying, we, yes, we are willing to come to the devil to reschedule, but we want transparency. We want to know exactly who Zambia owes, mm -hmm. and we understand China is among them, how much is owed to China and under what terms. So China was dilly dallying coming to the table. And there are other circumstances and other reasons China delayed. And this, this is my personal opinion. China delayed coming to the table because when the government changed hands, uh, the new government didn't really have a, uh, a positive view of China. Mm -hmm. The new government thought China was responsible for much of this debt. One of the reasons is that much of this debt was exaggerated. It, 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 it was um, credited to the infrastructure investments by Chinese uh, private companies in Zambia, but the, the, the infrastructure 
which is um, attributed to this date, was exaggerated in terms of payments. You know, there, there was a rent, you know, private rent uh, accruing to this. Uh, and, and the Zambian government felt this date was not real, it was exaggerated. And the overall relationship itself with China was not good. And now, when China had the IMF has given a condition to pre-agree with all the creditors on how to treat the external debt, China felt it would jump on this as a window yeah. to develop a new relationship with the, the new government. So it had, it now has a bait. Say, well, we, 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 we can talk. Uh, we can talk with Zambia. We are willing to negotiate, but also open a door for us to continue doing business with your with country. country. We still want to cement a relationship. And I think that is where it all comes from. Now China has agreed to the table, fi finally to meet the president of Zambia, they have been having discussions, they have met, and now we are running. Uh, so it's a win-win. China is winning in terms of enhancing its relationship with Zambia. And Zambia is also winning in terms of debt restructuring, which includes the Chinese debt. And as a result, we are going to get the IMF program. Okay, so now let me ask, the, well, let me, let's me let take a quick break because there is something that the IMF has said in terms of how Zambia's debt will look at the end of the three-year period. And I want to know what that means for Zambia. But Chibamba, just hold on. Zambia is making progress with its debt restructuring talks as China has now agreed to come to the table. But what does the future hold? And of course, many are watching to see how this plays out for other African countries who have requests of debt forgiveness or debt cancellation or restructuring of their own debt. Do stay with us. Still with me is Chibamba Kayama. He's an economist and former communications officer at the IMF. As we look at the progress of Zambia's debt talks. Now, Chibamba, as we've talked about now, uh, the IMF is, of course, has agreed uh, to staff level talks with Zambia. $1.4 billion extended credit facility that would be over three years. And what we're hearing is that by the end of that three years, Zambia's debt should be classified at moderate risk of distress. And this is also going to likely imply that there's going to be a greater write-down of the value of the country's debt. So at the end of three years, if Zambia's debt is able to now be classified as moderate risk of distress, what does that mean for the country and the country's economy? Well, it, it means a number of things. Uh, number one, it means that Zambia will be in a position to refinance its budget. Yeah, that's the first thing. Zambia will be in a position to refinance or finance its budget with uh, a huge amount of support coming from bilateral or concessional creditors. I don't think that Zambia wants to go the route of the commercial debt anymore. It wants to go the route of the commercial creditors. As you have already seen, the World Bank is already committing about 525 million euros dollars to Zambia. Half of that amount will be paid immediately, and the other amount will be dependent on a final program with the International Monetary Fund. And that is really what it means, that most of the bilateral creditors who had, who had stopped in the past 10 years, seven years, stopped uh, financing the budget, will come again and directly finance the Zambian debt. So it, it's, in other words, debt sustainability will be the key issue. That's the more, more moderate part of it. Um, as you know that all countries are sovereign rated and if the sovereign rating doesn't only affect the capability of a country to manage a debt and, and its capacity to repay, it also has implications on private companies as well. So the rating of a, a country, whether it's a moderate risk or lower risk, has direct implications on capability of the the private sector in a given country to borrow money outside or to raise capital of any nature, whether it's equity capital or debt finance, it has those implications. Why is because the, the fiscal position of a country, when a country is a, in debt distress, it, it affects the whole market. It interferes in the market and it affects the potential of the private sector to borrow money as well uh, and develop and grow the economy because there's a very direct link therefore between GDP and the capacity of a country to repay its debt. So in this case, when it's moderate risk, it, it, it has an implication also on the private company's capacity to borrow and raise capital on the international platform mm -hmm. because they know that there will be little connection or, 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 or inability of a country 
to have foreign debt, I mean foreign foreign resources. I mean, let me put it simply like this. Whenever you are in debt distress, you are really fighting for the foreign re for the reserves in a given country. So your reserves are very low. And to, to repay a debt, if you're a private company, to repay a debt you borrow, you got from an external partner, you have to get those dollar equivalents. You have to get the dollar equivalent to save that debt. But if the country is in debt distress, the first implication that is that its reserves are very, very low. Yeah. So that private company will, will, will really struggle a lot to raise this, the needed or required foreign debt interest payments to externalize outside because the country's risk profile is very bad. So okay. when it's moderate, it means that everything runs well. All right. So finally, I'll need you to answer this uh, question quickly, unfortunately, because of time. But observers have said that China is very likely not going to accept a very large write down of Zambia's debt. But there must be a give and take in this situation. China must give and take. Chinese lenders must give and take. And Zambia must also give and take in order to reach new timelines and schedules for the debt. So what do you envisage will happen uh, when these conversations talk uh, start and then we get an end with some kind of conclusion? I, I'm sure there'll be some level of haircut, what we call some haircut. Some of the data will completely be written off, and I'm sure that uh, some of the bilateral creditors, particularly the G20, will completely write off this date, okay, depending on how IMF looks at it. IMF is really pushing for this to happen, and this is a written, it's a done deal. Number two, even if China doesn't come full swing, but so long they are showing that commitment and willingness to restructure even a portion of that date. And the bulk of the right of not the right of but the restructuring comes from the other commercial creditors, that the euro bond holders. That is sufficient to bring on board the International Monetary Fund. But remember this, and I want to emphasize this point as we as I wind up. The stability of the Zambian environment, which will arise from restructured debt position, which will come about because of fiscal stability, because of the IMF program and everything to do with the economic stability of Zambia is in the interest of the Chinese investors and Chinese business people in Zambia. Mm. If they want to continue doing business with this country, they have got no choice but to do some haircut and agree for a long-term sustainability position for this country. So it's a win-win for China. It's not only for Zambia, it's for them, because they're not here just to get something and go away. They are here for a long-term investment um, positioning in the Zambian economy. Thank All right, you. we'll leave it at that for now. We do know we're looking for a few things, like the meeting of the World Bank and IMF uh, in June, their spring meeting, so we see uh, the approval for the staff level agreement and then other things from there. Uh, Chibamba, thank you so much, as always, for joining me. We'll be watching to see how this plays out. You're most welcome. Thank you so much. Sir. All right, thank you. And of course, the situation in Zambia is not marked really different from many others. It's just that it's the only African country that has defaulted. But there is an ongoing conversation around debt restructuring, debt forgiveness, uh, or even debt cancellation that's happening with African economies. Many will be watching to see how this plays out, how the lenders and the creditors behave, and what agreements come at the very end. And so will we. You're watching Business Edge. Up next is NC4 to Watch. And now to a few stories we're keeping our eyes on. We start in the southern part of the continent where the South African rand fell in early trade on Monday as the U.S. dollar scaled to a two-decade high amid growing concerns over slowing global economic growth and rising interest rates. This morning, the rand was trading at 16 rand 14 cents against the dollar, 0.76% weaker than its previous close. Zimbabwe's government has ordered banks to stop lending with immediate effect in a move designed to stop speculation against the Zimbabwean dollar and as part of a raft of measures to arrest the rapid devaluation of the currency on the black market. However, the Zimbabwean dollar, which is officially quoted at 165.94 against the U.S. dollar, has continued to slide on the black market, where it is trading between 330 and 400 to the greenback. In North Africa, Tunisia's Foreign Investment Promotion Agency said investments grew by 73% in the first three months of 2022 compared to the same period a year earlier. The European Union said in March it plans to lend 450 million euros, around $475 million, to support Tunisia's budget 
and said he would invest 4 billion euros in the coming years. And finally, oil price is still fluctuating as investors weigh a pledge by the group of seven most industrialized nations to ban imports of Russian crude against a cut in official prices by Saudi Arabia and the impact of China's energy sapping lockdowns. WTI for June delivery added 0.3% to $110.10 a barrel on the New York Mercantile Exchange this morning. While Brent for July settlements rose to $112.79 a barrel on the Ice Futures Europe Exchange. And that's the business we have for you today on Business Edge. Don't forget, follow us on social media, download our mobile app, and watch us on the platforms we are available. I'll see you again soon. I'm Tolu Lope. Adilari. Follow